Peter J. Lightheart is president of the Theopolis Institute in Birmingham, Alabama, where he also serves as teacher at Trinity Presbyterian Church. He received a BA in English and History from Hillsdale College, a Master of Arts in Religion, and a Master of Theology from Westminster Theological Seminary, and a PhD from the University of Cambridge. He has served as pastor of Reformed Heritage Presbyterian Church, now Trinity Presbyterian Church, and as pastor of Trinity Reformed Church in Moscow, Idaho, a former professor of theology and literature at New St. Andrews College, and a bi-weekly columnist for First Things, Dr. Lightheart is the author of numerous books, including a two-volume commentary on Revelation, and most recently, Baptism, A Guide to Life from Death. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Lightheart. Thank you, Gretchen. Uh, thanks to Matt Bell, and thanks to everyone associated with CCA for inviting me. Uh, as Gretchen mentioned, I am a graduate of Hillsdale College. I realized to my shock earlier this weekend, or this week, that uh, it's been 40 years since I graduated. Uh, that's a, a shocking number. Um, it's very good to be back here. It's a very different school than I attended, as you can imagine. This, none of this existed. Many of the buildings didn't exist. Uh, and it's a, always a delight to be back here and uh, to get reacquainted with some old friends and to be able to speak to you uh, students and other visitors to the CCA. Uh, I want to do a couple of preliminaries before I begin. The first is my usual disclaimer whenever I talk about Jane Austen. Uh, and the disclaimer is that I know there are dozens in this room who know Jane Austen's novels better than I do. So I beg your indulgence. Uh, the second preliminary, I'm going to do, try to get you to do something for me. Uh, I wrote a book called Miniatures and Morals some years ago, uh, which is a study of Jane Austen's six published novels. And uh, I titled my introduction, Real Men Read Austen. <laughs> because, of course, men, especially young men, think that they're girly books, but they're not. And so I've tried this before with not much success. I've tried to get a crowd to chant with me, real men read Austin. <laughs> so I'm gonna say it once and then I wanna join you to join in. And three times I want you to say, real men read Austin. I'll, I'll set the rhythm by saying it myself first. Real men read Austin. Real men read Austin. Real men read Austin. Real men read Austin. Thank you. That was far more successful than the last attempt. And I hope you young men and older men out there who have not read Austen are now ashamed <laughs> of your lack of reading. My topic tonight is morality and Jane Austen, and I am going to read my paper. I'll try to uh, make some eye contact occasionally, but uh, just to make sure I stay within my time limit and say everything that I had planned to say, I'll be reading. Uh, let me outline what I have to say about Jane Austen and morality. Uh, first, I want to examine the miniaturism of Austen's style and storytelling. Second, I'll explain how her miniaturism determines the scope of her moral concerns. By that I mean the zone within which the moral life is lived out. Third, I want to show that Austen's literary style expresses the substance of her moral outlook. Style isn't merely a surface phenomenon for Austen. Rather, Austen's style exemplifies a view of the world in a moral perspective and models the comic discernment and truth-telling that she wishes to instill in her readers. A well-known quotation from another woman writer will orient us at the outset. In an 1850 letter to the editor W.S. Williams, Charlotte Bronte complains that Austen's novels are altogether too tranquil. Austen ruffles her readers by nothing vehement, disturbs them with nothing profound. The passions are perfectly unknown to her. She rejects even a speaking acquaintance with that stormy sisterhood. Austen's problem in Bronte's view is that she keeps to surfaces and never penetrates emotional depths. This is Bronte again. Her business is not half so much with the human heart as with human eyes, mouth, hands, and feet. What sees keenly 
speaks aptly, moves flexibly, it suits her to study. But what throbs fast and full, though hidden, what the blood rushes through, what is un the unseen seat of life and the sentient target of death, that Miss Austin ignores. Bronte musters only this backhanded compliment. She does her business of delineating the surface of the lives of genteel English people curiously well. There is a Chinese fidelity, a miniature delicacy in the painting. Now, I think there's much wrong with Bronte's assessment of Austin, but she also gets something right. And though Bronte would not have known it, Austin describes her own work in remarkably similar terms in a letter that she wrote to her nephew, James Edward Austin Lee. James, her nephew, had misplaced two and a half chapters of a manuscript he had been working on, and he had mentioned that in a letter to Aunt Jane, and Aunt Jane sent this teasing letter back. It is well that I have not been at Steventon lately, she writes and therefore cannot be suspected of purloining them. <laughs> Two strong twigs and a half towards a nest of my own would have been something. I do not think, however, that any theft of that sort would have really been very useful to me. What should I do with your strong, manly, vigorous sketches full of variety and glow? How could I possibly join them onto the little bit of ivory on which I work with so fine a brush as produces little effect after much labor? We know from other letters that Austin made a deliberate decision to devote her life to brushwork on two-inch two inch bits of ivory. In a letter to her niece, Anna, another writer, Austin says, you are now collecting your people delightfully, getting them exactly into such a spot as is the delight of my life. Three or four families in a country village is the very thing to work on. In another letter, she advises Anna to write about what she knows. She advises her not to take her characters that she's writing about to Ireland. Let the Portmans go to Ireland, but as you know nothing of manners there, you had better not go with them. You will be in danger of giving false representations. In reply to Reverend James Stanier Clark's suggestion that she write a romance, Austin bluntly insists that she'll continue to paint such pictures of domestic life in country villages as I deal in. And she continues, I could no more write a romance than an epic poem. I could not sit down seriously to write a serious romance under any other motive than to save my life. And if it were indispensable for me to keep it up and never relax into laughing at myself or other people, I am sure I should be hung before I had finished the first chapter. No, I must keep to my own style and my own way. And though may, I may never succeed again in that, I am convinced that I should totally fail in any other. Austin's deliberate miniaturism, her focus on three or four families in a country village, is evident in virtually every facet of her literary art. She limits her novels with respect to action, so much so that it's often said, especially by male readers, I suppose, that nothing happens in Austin's stories. That's true if you're expecting overturned carriages, car chases, or perhaps zombies. There's remarkably little violence or even vigorous action. At worst, Marianne Dashwood falls and sprains her ankle on a hill and later catches a bad cold. Or Louisa Musgrove falls off a wall and gets a nasty bump on her head. One critic has said that the most violent thing that happens in Pride and Prejudice occurs when Elizabeth jumps over a stile on the way to visit her sister Jane at Netherfield Park. In Sense and Sensibility, Colonel Brandon duels with Willoughby. No, neither one is injured. But that, is, that scene is not shown, and it's spoken of so cryptically and briefly that readers easily miss it. No one, as far as I recall or been able to find, ever bleeds in an Austen novel. But most importantly, Austen is a miniaturist of style. She does more with less than any other English writer. There's a precision and lack of ornamentation in her prose that I suspect owes much to the Bible and the Book of Common Prayer. This makes her simply the most elegant prose stylist and one of the most innovative in English literature. After reading Austen, every other writer seems bloated, even if I dare to blaspheme as stylish a writer as C.S. Lewis. Let me give a guess. Oh, I heard the, <laughs> I heard the rejoinders forming. Uh, let me make, uh, give several examples to make my point. 
Uh, first, Austin pays her readers the compliment of not spelling out every detail of plots. She would have made a great mystery novelist, I think, because she expects her readers to draw conclusions from the limited information that she provides. Toward the end of Pride and Prejudice, for example, Lady Catherine de Bourgh shows up at Longbourn, as we saw in the movie yesterday, to pressure Elizabeth Darcy to give up all hope of marrying Mr. Darcy. During this spirited exchange, which does not, in the original, become a ninja battle, during this spirited exchange, Lady Catherine reveals that she had received a report about the engagement two days ago. Earlier, she had told Mrs. Bennett that she left the Collinses the night before last. Elizabeth later puts the pieces together and realizes that Lady Catherine learnt, heard, of the, heard the rumor of Darcy's impending proposal from Mr. and Mrs. Collins. But Lady Catherine gives us all the facts we need to put two and two together ourselves. Similarly, at several points in Emma, Miss Bates provides crucial information about the puzzling relationship between Frank Churchill and Jane Fairfax. But we need to pay careful attention to her rambling gossip to get the point. Few readers do. We as readers are as impatient with Miss Bates as Emma is. Also at the end of Emma, unlike the movie we saw this afternoon, uh, Miss, Mrs. Elton does complain about the lack of elegance at Emma's wedding, but the narrator tells us that she was not even at the wedding. It says that she drew her conclusions, quote, from the particulars detailed by her husband. Austin frequently leaves settings to the reader's imagination as well. Writing to her niece, Anna, she offers this advice. You describe a sweet place, but your descriptions are often more minute than will be liked. You give too many particulars of right hand and left. Austin often creates the illusion of a scene with a few strokes and props, like a caricaturist who captures a face with a line or two. On Knightley's first visit to Hartfield at the beginning of Emma, nothing in the room is mentioned besides a backgammon table, a fire, and the visitor. There's no description of Knightley's physical appearance or of the room, and even some of the props in the room, some of the objects in the room, are mentioned by the characters rather than by the narrator. Austin rounds off characters with an economy that borders on the miraculous. After a little more than two pages of dialogue at the beginning of Pride and Prejudice, we know Mr. and Mrs. Bennett, their relationship with each other, their relationships with their daughters, their hopes, especially Mrs. Bennett's hopes, their faults and follies, Mrs. Bennett's nerves, and Mr. Bennett's sardonic distance. This compressed characterization frequently expresses Austin's conviction that syntax is character. How someone speaks manifests his moral quality as much as, or even more, than what he says. Mr. Collins appears in Pride, uh, before Mr. Collins appears in Pride of Prejudice, he's been introduced by a letter that he wrote in which he discusses his breach with the Bennett family and his eventual inheritance of the Bennett home at Longbourn. This is from his letter. The disagreements subsisting between, my, between yourself and my later, late honored father always gave me much uneasiness. And since I have had the misfortune to lose him, I have frequently wished to heal the breach. But for some time I was kept back by my own doubts, fearing lest it might seem disrespectful to his memory for me to be on good terms with anyone with whom it always pleased him to be at variance. As a clergyman, moreover, I feel it my duty to promote and establish the blessing of peace in all families within the reach of my influence. And on these grounds I flatter myself that my present overtures of goodwill are highly commendable that the circumstance of my being next in the entail at Longbourn will be kindly overlooked on your side and not lead you to reject the olive branch. Anyone whose speech or writing is as convoluted and orotund as Collins's cannot be sensible. Elizabeth gets him exactly right. Just by hearing the letter, she knows there's something pompous in his style. And if the style is pompous, so is the man. For Austin's characters, just as for Austin herself, Style is substantive. One of my favorite examples of this principle of syntax and character, the connection between syntax and character, comes from Emma, where Austin relates Mrs. Elton's stream of consciousness during the strawberry picking outing at Knightley's Dunwell Hall. This is Mrs. Elton. The best fruit in England, everybody's favorite, always wholesome. These the finest beds and the finest sorts, delightful to gather for oneself the only way of really enjoying them. Morning decidedly the best time, never tired, every sort good. Oh boy, infinitely superior, 
no comparison. The others, hardly eatable. Oh boy, very scarce. Chili preferred, white wood finest flavor of all. Price of strawberries in London. Abundance about Bristol, Maple Grove. Cultivations, beds, when to be renewed. Gardeners thinking exactly different. No general rule. Gardeners never to be put out of their way. Delicious fruit, only too rich to be eaten much of. Inferior to cherries, currants more refreshing. Only objection to gathering strawberries, the stooping, glaring sun, tired to death, could bear it no longer, must go and sit in the shade. <laughs> Mrs. Elton is all there. The contradictory opinions, each expressed with utter confidence, the randomness, the reversion to her obsessive themes like her home of Maple Grove, the domineering know-it-allness. One fragmented paragraph captures a whole person. And again, it's not what she's saying, but how her mind moves that reveals her character. One indication of Collins's poverty of style and hence of his mind is poverty of metaphor. Austin has been characterized as a relentlessly non-metaphorical writer, but I think that's misleading. Though she rarely uses explicit similes or metaphors, her language is metaphorical in a more, more profound sense. She has an intuitive grasp of the inherent relatedness of things, and she often adapts language from one realm of life to describe another, which is the essence of metaphor. When she wishes, she's capable of producing striking metaphorical formulas. In Emma, during the strawberry picking scene, she writes of Mrs. Bon Mrs. Elton's bonnet and basket as her apparatus of happiness. She describes the aftermath of Elton's proposal to Emma by saying that their straightforward emotions left no room for the little zigzags of embarrassment. And in Sense and Sensibility, she refers to the puppyism of Robert Fair's manners. None of these is formally a metaphor, but they all manifest Austin's profound metaphorical imagination. What Austin de despises is not metaphor, but metaphors that are so overworked that they ought to have been retired. In a letter to her niece, Anna, she warns against using the phrase vortex of dissipation. And she explains, I do not object to the thing, but I cannot bear the expression. It is such thorough novel slang and so old that I dare say Adam met with it in the first novel he opened. <laughs> Collins' use of olive branch is a sign of his folly, for that metaphor is as old as Noah, if not Adam. Metaphors tend to die and fossilize, and once that happens, they can be used without thought. Dead metaphors shift the mind into autopilot and thus hinder the arduous labor of discernment. In a sense, Bronte was right. Austin delineates the surfaces of English life, and she does it without embellishment in restrained crystalline prose. But this doesn't make her a superficial writer because her attention to surfaces opens up an attention to substantive truth and moral insight. Behind Austin's aesthetic decision to limit herself to what she knows is what could be called a philosophical stance that's vaguely nominalist. Particulars, Austin sensed, are all we can talk about with any degree of accuracy or detail. About universals, we can say very little since universals, by definition, lack particular qualities. In Northanger Abbey, Henry Tilney's discourse on the theory of the picturesque ends ultimately in silence. Delighted with Catherine Borland's progress, Austin writes, and fearful of wearying her with too much wisdom at once, Henry suffered the subject to decline and by an easy transition from a piece of rocky fragment and the withered oak which he had placed near its summit to oaks in general, to forests, the enclosure of them, wastelands, crownlands, and government, he shortly found himself arrived at politics. And from politics, it was an easy step to silence. <laughs> the broader the scope of discourse for Austin, the less opportunity there is for this fine discrimination, for the nuances and shades of difference that are necessary for true knowledge and sound judgment. The larger the scope of discourse, the more everything blurs into undifferentiated, undifferentiated smoothness that Austin and many of her characters abhor. But it's precisely this nominalism, 
this minute attention, attention to the surfaces of character and relation that makes Austen's work a continuing source of moral instruction. Because of her limitations, she emphasizes the domestic and local contexts for moral decisions and action. The very contexts in which most of our moral decisions and actions occur. For Austen, the sensational doesn't provide a sound basis for moral reasoning. Hers isn't a lifeboat ethics, focusing on marginal extremes of decision making. On the contrary, she recognizes that the greatest moral challenges come in the midst of daily life, precisely when nothing is happening. Austen's concentration on the quotidian is related to what C.S. Lewis described as Austen's untragic moral outlook. Her core convictions are exacting insofar as obedience is rigidly demanded. Neither excuses nor experiments are allowed. Austen's principles provide the grammar of con conduct, being something that anyone can learn and something that everyone must learn. On the other hand, her moral vision is, Lewis says, unexacting, insofar as the duties commanded are not quixotic or heroic, and obedience to them will not be very difficult to properly brought up people in ordinary circumstances. Austin is untragic also in, her cheer, in the cheerful moderation of her joys. Again, this is Lewis. If she envisaged a few great sacrifices, she also envisages no grandiose schemes of joy. She has, or at least all her favorite characters have, a hearty relish for what would now be regarded as very modest pleasures. A ball, a dinner party, books, conversation, a drive to see a great house 10 miles away, a holiday as far away as Derbyshire, these, with affection and good manners, are happiness. Unlike post-romantic novelists and philosophers, Austen doesn't pose ultimate questions. She doesn't struggle against the void or probe the mysteries of the universe. She doesn't, doesn't pose these questions because I think for her they were not questions. They're settled. A lifelong member of the Church of England, a preacher's kid, a priest's kid, she believed that the grand questions could be answered by consulting the 39 articles. For Austin, the moral challenge of life is not to puzzle out the meaning of the universe, but to live well in particular and given social and domestic settings. The moral philosopher Alistair McIntyre discerns an Aristotelian strain in Austin's recognition that virtues are formed, tested, and manifested within communities. As Aristotle recognizes, this makes ethics a subdivision of politics. The question, what should I do, is a sub-question under what kind of community do I live in and what is my place in it? For both Austin and Aristotle, the moral life is status-specific. To answer the question, what should I do in this case, we have to ask, who am I? And the latter question is not about some ghostly inner I, but out the, about the role and status that I have in a particular social setting. Darcy must not only ask, as a Bronte character might, shall I, who passionately love Elizabeth Bennet's fine eyes, pursue Elizabeth Bennet? He must also consider the exterior of the situation. Shall I, with my name and status as an English nobleman, pursue Elizabeth Bennet with her status, her name, and her family? When Knightley castigates Emma for her treatment of Miss Bates, as we saw in the movie this afternoon, he challenges her on precisely this point. Consider your position in the society of the town, he chides, and the obligation your position places on you to show kindness to an unfortunate, if silly, spinster like Miss Bates. Morality is not about individuals seeking to live a good life, about solitary decision makers striving for ethical perfection. A moral person must learn to navigate well among the surfaces of social life. Given the well-defined strata of the communities that Austin deals in, this was a more obvious question for her and for her characters than it might be for us, but it's still a moral, a central and perennial moral question. Deciding what is right is never a, simply a matter of what should I as a human being do. It's always what should I as a college student or as a husband or wife or as a car mechanic do in this or that specific situation. This is not relativism. It doesn't mean there are no absolutes of right and wrong, but it does mean that the absolutes have particular application to particular people in particular circumstances. Only a sophomoric morality will ignore the specificity of our moral decisions and actions, and Austin was no sophomore. 
In one important respect, I think Austin's moral vision surpasses Aristotle's. In the Nicomachean Ethics, Aristotle distinguishes between different sorts of action, which he describes as poesis and praxis. Production, or poesis, is different from praxis, action. And Aristotle says the reasoned state that is capable of action is also different from that which is capable of production. Hence, neither is included in the other because action, praxis, is not poesis, production, nor production, action. For Aristotle, ethics deals with praxis, with intransitive action, actions that don't produce anything outside of the actor, but bear fruit only in the character and virtue of the actor himself. Poesis is the realm of transitive action, like building a table. That's an action that produces something outside yourself. By Aristotle's distinction, the realm of the, of the arts and of economic production is, strictly speaking, outside the boundaries of the ethical. But I think that distinction is a mistake. The assumption that our actions can be confined to ourselves, that we can engage in praxis without producing anything outside ourselves. However, Aristotelian Austin is in other respects. She implicitly rejects this distinction, for she knows implicitly that every action is poetic, it's productive. The effects of our actions are never confined simply to ourselves. We always produce and proliferate effects in the world. All actions are transitive. Austin's villains don't recognize this. Henry and Mary Crawford in Mansfield Park are individualists in the sense that they follow their own desires regardless of what the authorities say or do. When Sir Thomas Bertram is away on business, they take part in a theatrical production at Mansfield Park even though they're warned that the production, that the master of the house would disapprove, and even over the initial objections of Edmund, who's responsible for maintaining the house in his father's absence. More subtly, the Crawfords have no sense that their actions have consequences beyond themselves. <clears throat> when Henry runs off with Maria Bertram, now Mrs. Rushworth, Mary Crawford still hopes that Edmund will marry her, will marry Mary. She's utterly insensible to the fact that her brother's scandal might affect her in some way. She sees herself as completely disconnected from her brother's immoral action. Austin's characters experience moral illumination and growth as we heard last night from James Bowman, and her novels are designed to train readers as well. And I wanna close with a few observations about how this is so, how her novels are designed to be moral training for the reader. First, since the moral life is lived within a particular social setting, <clears throat> excuse me, Austin is deeply concerned with moral education and guidance. Moral guides are needed in part because language and manners can function as disguises. The critic Tony Tanner has made the point well in his book on Austin. For Austin, good manners are essential to preserving social order and living the moral life. Yet in the very places and times when manners are most on display, they are most difficult to read correctly. A ball is an occasion for a country village to parade, enact, and practice its codes of conduct. A ball is an inherently theatrical occasion when everyone is acting according to the script of manners. But then how can you tell when somebody is acting his acting, being insincere in his acting, or actually being sincere about his manners. Everyone finds Frank Churchill's manners pleasing, but in the book, at least, Emma can't quite figure out what he truly was. And we know that Elizabeth Bennet's first impressions of Wickham and Darcy, formed during a ball, are badly mistaken. Like cliches and dead metaphors, manners can dull the mind. Smooth style can charm, seduce, and obscure rather than reveal character. Austin's heroines need training in hermeneutics, in interpretation, in order to discern the moral substance of words and gestures that they encounter. Austin's books are, among other things, exercises in moral suspicion. By tracing the surface contours of characters and situations, she trains her readers to distinguish true actors from duplicitous ones. Second, Austin's measured style models the kind of truth-telling that's required to live with moral integrity. Austin's characters must learn above all to see and tell the truth about themselves, to recognize, as James Bowman said, when they are wrong. 
I cannot express my own abhorrence of myself, cries Marianne Dashwood. When Elizabeth Bennett recognizes the truth about Wickham, she's devastated. How humiliating is this discovery, yet how just a humiliation. How to understand it all, Emma Woodhouse asks in, at the moment of her illumination. How to understand the deceptions she had been practicing on herself and living under. We become truth tellers, at least in part, when we mimic the precision of Austin's style. To tell the truth, we have to renounce the mind-dulling metaphors and cliches that kill thought and promote groupthink. Truth-telling requires the self-restraint to speak what we know, to fall silent when we're ignorant, and to check the emotions that cloud our discernment. It demands that we do more than express our passing sensations and whims, as Mrs. Elton was doing in that passage I read. Truth-telling depends on clarity and charity of vision, on courage and tact. I'm afraid I've made Austin sound ponderous and priggish. Nothing, of course, could be further from the truth. She is among the most bemused and amusing writers in English literature, not in spite of her moral firmness, but because of it. As Lewis observed, the hardcore morality and even of religion seems to me to be just what makes good comedy possible. Were there no norm, nothing can be ridiculous, except for a brief moment of unbalanced provincialism in which we may laugh at the merely unfamiliar. Unless there is something about which the author is never ironical, there can be no true irony in the work. So Austin's moral clarity is what enables her to write splendid scenes like the one where Eleanor and Marianne Dashwood first encounter Robert Ferris at a jewelry shop in Sense and Sensibility. Robert, ignoring all the other customers, is engaged in a grandiose quest for the perfect toothpick case. This is from Sense and Sensibility. He was giving orders for a toothpick case for himself until its size, shape, and ornaments were determined all of which, after examining and debating for a quarter of an hour over every toothpick case in the shop, were finally arranged by his own inventive fancy. He had no leisure to bestow any other attention on the two ladies than what was comprised in three or four very broad stares. A kind of notice which served to imprint on Eleanor the remembrance of a person and face of strong, natural, sterling insignificance, though adorned in the first style of fashion. At last, the affair was decided. The ivory, the gold, the pearls all received their appointment, and the gentleman, having named the last day on which his existence could be continued without the possession of this toothpick case, <laughs> drew on his glove with leisurely care and bestowing another glance on the Miss Dashwoods, but such a one as seemed rather to demand than express admiration, walked off with a happy air of real conceit and affected indifference. That is a masterpiece of comic writing, most particularly in the central description of the impression that Robert leaves on Eleanor. When Austin follows a string of adjectives like strong, natural, sterling, with the noun insignificance, you can hear Robert Ferris deflating. He's a man of style without sumpter, uh, substance, punctured by the repeated pricks of Austin's moral comedy. Eleanor might well echo Elizabeth Bennett's evaluation of Collins' letter. There is something pompous in Robert's manners. In Austin, comedy, morality, and style form a chord of three stand, strands. Her stylistic miniaturism focuses our attention on everyday life, where her comic insight exposes the absurd insubstantiality of every mere facade. Charlotte Bronte notwithstanding, Austin's Chinese fidelity, her miniature delicacy, her self-professed devotion to fine brushwork on a sliver of ivory is not a defect. It's the vehicle of her moral vision and the foundation of her moral art. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lightheart. We do have some time for Q&A. If you have a question, please make your way to one of the side aisles. So I think what I'm going to say is, is instructive to young people. 
Uh, what, does, what does Emma represent? Well, she's on one hand a busybody. She's actively talking with people. She finds out, she drives towards a goal, uh, sometimes uh, illusional, but she wants to accomplish something. What is the practical value? The practical value is for young people nowadays is to be a busybody, but at a different level. Read different things, find out, ask questions, exchange ideas, be a person who's active, who's driving towards a goal. Through that process, you're going to be standing out, you're going to accomplish more, you're going to be noticed, you're going to be more successful. I'll take that as a comment, thank you. <clears throat> I'm Hi. trying to get out of the spotlight, that's why I'm moving around. Hi, thank you so much for your talk, it was amazing. Um, I'm wondering, in your talk, why is truth revealed in letters in particulars, for example, the particular roles that people play in society and status, um, if it should ideally supersede these particulars and reach higher things, more abstract things? Than, the first part of the question. Sorry. Um, why is truth revealed in Jane Austen's novels, in letters and particulars, if it should ideally supersede these constructs and reach more abstract things, if you know what I mean. Yeah, I, I think I know. If I if I don't answer the question, re, you can try it again. Um, well, I think that uh, Austen is Austen definitely believes in, uh, and she uses abstract moral categories, uh, and she uses them a lot. The kind of the kind of uh, uh, abstract moral categories that were the the, uh, uh, the normal parlance of moralists of her time. So it's, it's not that she avoids that, but uh, she, she's never talking about those in kind of a, a merely in a theoretical fashion, but they're always, in, they're always exemplified in particular situations with, with people who have particular constraints on their behavior for various reasons uh, and are, are uh, called to do certain things in certain circumstances. So I, I'm not sure that the I'm not sure that Austin's thinking is you rise from the particulars to the universals. Uh, there may be that may be one part of the movement, but I think it's a, probably uh, something more like a double movement. You have to rise from particulars, and you do have to work with some kind of general moral categories, but then you also have to go back to the particulars because just living in these general moral abstractions is not living a moral life. So I think it's a double movement. Um, and the point I was trying to make was the, the focus that she, she places on the, uh, on, on the particulars in, as the, the place where those abstract qualities are worked out. Is that, is that getting at the question you were asking? Yeah. Yeah, and were you asking about uh, the use of letters? Uh, you mentioned. Okay. So, yes, letters, like for example, the particulars that they go into in some of the letters, like the mannerisms that are conveyed through letters, oh, giving people their first impressions. Right. Is this supposed to be truth? Is this supposed to be how you find truth about certain people? Or does, is it supposed to exceed, ideally, for Austin, like those letters? And yeah, well, again, I think it, yeah, my, my point, the, I think it's a, it's a kind of double movement. I do think it's, it's interesting how much of, Austin, much of the action of Austin's novels turns on the reception and delivery of letters. Uh, and of course, this was a, this was a, 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 a novelistic style at the time that she experimented with in some of her early work with epistolary novels. James Bowman made passing reference to this last evening. But even when she's not writing an epistolary novel, you know, the, the, uh, uh, Elizabeth Bennet's uh, recognition of Darcy's character partly comes from visiting his, his home you know, and imagining herself as the lady of that house. But it also comes from a letter that he gives. And I think there's something about the, this message from a distance and it leaves the character alone with this new information, rather than always in. Sometimes it's in a, in an interpersonal conflict, uh, per interpersonal exchange, like, uh, like uh, Mr. Knightley's uh, chiding of, ben, uh, of Emma. That's that takes place in person, but a lot of the a lot of the new information comes from outside, and the and the character is left alone to try to assess this new information, try to adjust, uh, recognize the wrongness of what they had been thinking, uh, in isolation. Yeah, so this may be less of a like writing style question, more of like a life application question. You mentioned like 15 minutes into the lecture, uh, most of the characters have this like hearty relish for modest pleasures. 
so I, I'm a psych major, so one of the things that we talk about all the time is how like our generation, the previous generation, some of their biggest qualms with life is a, like a general lack of meaning or a general like lack of pleasure in things. It, it seems too finite in many ways. So would you chalk that down to a, like there, there's no real appreciation for the modest pleasures anymore or just a general lack of modesty in society today? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a really good question. I, it's hard to generalize about what's happening. I think uh, a couple things I would say, um, I, don't, I don't think this is, I'm going beyond Austin here, uh, expressing my own, uh, my own views about, and saying it the way I would have. I think there's, there's probably an, a, uh, something like a metaphysical deficit in that experience. Uh, th th that is uh, a, uh, a failure to appreciate uh, what, what reality is. And I think that's a, um, there's a theological and religious dimension to that. Uh, if you believe that reality is uh, from uh, top to bottom a gift of an infinite God, then there's, you know, the smallest delight uh, is, uh, is worthy of your attention and, and pleasure. Uh, and if you don't, if you think that this is just a, a, a product of chance and, uh, and long periods of time, then you have a different you have a different uh, you have a different metaphysics a different conception, and I also think of the, the a number of theologians of late have been uh, calling attention to the medieval notion of, of sloth. Uh, the term is ascidia. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's the, it's the, it would be the term that Dante uses in the in uh, the in the uh, Inferno. Ascidia is not just laziness, but ascidia is a, a just a complete lack of delight in the world, a complete, uh, it's, it's kind of the whatever mentality. I've, I've done that, there's nothing in the world that's going to interest or delight me. Uh, and I think there's a jadedness to uh, maybe particularly younger generations, I don't know if that's the case, but it may have something to do with the, the, uh, the ways that technologies have taken over, uh, the lack of contact with, uh, with uh, an unmediated world, I think there's, there's something in that. But there's this, there's this general mood of acedia that I think is uh, has a number of different roots, but that, that's that's how I would describe it. I was interested by your point, and I definitely saw the relevance of it, how Austin handles morality as applied to what is expected of someone as a member of a certain social class or certain standing. So I'm curious on your thoughts on the end of Pride and Prejudice. Even though things with Lydia all patched up, clearly something wasn't right there. So is Darcy essentially going against that norm, or do we think Austin's saying there's something stronger and different and even more valuable to what he did instead of just avoiding her family because of that? Yeah, I, I, I agree with what James Bowman said last evening, that she took, she took the uh, class, class system for granted. I don't think she's a critic of it. But I think, that, I think we, we, can, we can misunderstand what the class system is about, and mis particularly misunderstand the uh, the the, uh, the obligations that um, upper classes uh, had uh, in in a traditional in a traditional English society, uh, they weren't just being being a, a master of a great house was not just a privilege, a privilege of wealth and you know the possibility of command, but it also imposed obligations to care for those who were were under your under your uh, authority. Or, or, or dependent on you in some way. I think Mr. Knightley, I think, is a great uh, illustration of that kind of, uh, that kind of nobility uh, as a status, but also as a, as a character trait. And it involves uh, charity, and it involves things like what Darcy does to, to uh, resolve the scandal of the Bennett family. I think that's, that's, an act of, that's an act of excessive charity, obviously coming out of his affection for Elizabeth in large part. But it's also an act of charity that's consistent with the obligations that would be placed on somebody in, sta in his status. So, um, uh, yeah, I, I think that that's, I, I don't think that, I, I think it's a, we tend to misunderstand what status is about in, in Austin's time. And it, it had both obligations and privileges attached to it. Um. So you mentioned um, that people in Austin's day had to find out, um, you know, like, perceive someone's character through good manners and dialogue. Um, and then you also talked about how um, Austin describes a lot of the scenes and characters through dialogue. Um, 
Do you think that she's trying to get her readers to practice that same perception of characters and of the situation from the dialogue that her heroines have to practice? Yes, I do. I think that's, I think that uh, it was, I mean, this is a, this a kind of ancient notion of literary, of the purposes of literature, which is never simply to delight, but to delight and instruct. So I think that the, the design is not just to tell a good story, you know, to, to elicit the oohs and the ahs that I heard in the audience during the uh, closing scenes of Emma. That's part of it. Uh, she, she wants to write stories that are interesting and that have this kind of emotional charge. But she, she intends to instruct and she's trying to get, uh, uh, trying to provide her readers with uh, tools, maybe models, in order to discern uh, between the, as I, as I described it, as the, the true actors and duplicitous ones. Um, Stanley Fish, um, kind of a radical critic, uh, uh, wrote his, I think his first book, he was a, a Milton scholar early on, and uh, one of his first books, I think his first book was called Surprised by Sin, it's about Paradise Lost. And his argument was that um, the attraction of Satan in, in Paradise Lost is not an error on Milton's part, but it's part of the design of the poem. Um, you have, you have romantic, <laughs> romantic readers like William Blake uh, who think that uh, Satan is the hero of the poem. Uh, Fish says that that's not at all Milton's intention and Milton didn't lose control of his character. He wants to make Satan attractive because he wants to put the reader through the same experience of temptation that the characters are going through. Uh, and I think that kind, of, that kind of moral rhetoric is part of Austen's design too. She's trying to put her readers through the same kind of process of discernment, uh, illumination of their own, their own failings. So I, I, there's I think there's definitely that moral character to it. So you mentioned um, the 39 articles and the Church of England, um, but reading Austen's novels and watching the movies especially, I don't see much like religion explicitly mentioned. Um, is there a reason for that? And would you say that those particulars in Jane Austen's life, um, those aspects of her life, that they affected her novels in um, subtle ways? And how, how, would they, how did they do that? Yeah, uh, a, a couple of things. First of all, I, I think there's more uh, religious interest overtly in Austen's novels than we sometimes recognize. There are a lot of clergymen. Some of the clergymen are, uh, are parodied, I'm Collins and Elton particularly, but not all of them. And, and even, I mean, there's a, there's a long a Christian tradition of poking fun at the clergy. I mean, that's, that's not a new thing with Jane Austen. Um, but you also have characters like uh, Edmund, uh, Edmund Bertram in, uh, in Mansfield Park, which is, I think Mansfield Park is the most overtly theological and religious of her novels. And um, there, are, there are conversations with, between Mary Crawford and uh, Ed, uh, Edmund Bertram about the vocation of a, of a minister. Uh, Mary Crawford is a kind of temptress trying to divert Edmund from his vocation which is to enter the ministry and be a priest. And he sees his role as being one of uh, kind of, uh, uh, it's, it's not a high position socially, but he sees it as, a, as crucial to developing uh, 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 communities and developing moral human beings. So he sees it as a, as a very high calling and Mary, Mary Crawford is trying to belittle it. So you have some overt discussions like that. And there have been some critics, and I think there's something to this, there have been some critics who have suggested, uh, I, I don't remember who it was, but dis, uh, described Austen's romances as being Anglican romances. Um, there's a, uh, there are, uh, the various, there are various considerations that go into the resolution of a romance in Austen. Um, there, obviously there's attraction, uh, there's compatibility of, uh, of taste and uh, temper Money is an important, uh, and that's not cynical. She knows that money is an important consideration. But there's also something happens that, that's just um, inexplicable. There's, there's, there's this kind of, uh, I don't know, you call it magic or grace. You could, uh, they shouldn't use that terminology, not often. But there's uh, something else that's active in those romances that, that brings out the happy ending. So I think there's something to it. Uh, uh, 
it is sub, it is uh, background in in many of her novels. It's not it's not foregrounded, but I think it's I think it's there. And just personally, I mean, she grew up in a home of a Church of England uh, priest. Uh, she had brothers who were uh, involved, who were who were uh, uh, who were priests in the Church of England. She was surrounded by it. She was uh, she she had uh, her entire life was in the Church of England. So it doesn't come out overtly. Um, that may be a matter of, that may also be the Anglicanism of her romances, because, you know, Anglicans tend to be a little bit reticent about their faith. Not, not as, not as uh, they don't tend to be as effusive as evangelicals are. Um, Dr. Lightheart, in answer to another student's question, you mentioned that Jane Austen frequently utilizes the message from a distance in order to make her characters encounter a moral challenge. However, in your talk, you also mentioned um, that the greatest moral challenges occur in the midst of daily life. So I'm curious what you believe is the significance um, in connection to those two, how she makes the characters make the decision within a social setting, but also encounter those challenges in solitude. Yeah, yeah. I, w I wouldn't put those two in opposition to each other. I think the, um, the, the letter that if Elizabeth Bennett receives, for example, is about the things that have happened in those different social settings, uh, the misjudgments that she's made, the, uh, the, the wrong impressions that she's formed about different characters. Uh, and uh, there's that moment of her being isolated, but it's, it, it's integrated into that larger social setting. So I, I wouldn't put those two in opposition. They're, uh, yeah, they're different moments within the everyday life that they're experiencing. Did you have, want to follow up? Um, so do you believe, is it, is it necessary for your, each character to have that solitude after, like in order to process the social setting or not necessarily? Yeah, I'd have to, I'd have to think more about specifics to know if that happens in every case. I, I think there's a, uh, there, there are different degrees of it, I guess. Uh, I'd, I'd just have to, I'd have to think through examples. Thanks. Hi. Um, just a, a particular uh, Pride and Prejudice question. At the, toward the end of the novel, um, as Elizabeth is kind of waking up to the fact that uh, Darcy might be worth her while, uh, she reflects pretty critically on her parents. Um, and, uh, you know, I think her father comes out uh, better for it, but her mother comes out worse for the wear. Um, and in one sense, what you can see is she's so, she's so acute to the way in which her mother a sense against social norms. Um, and so she's understanding uh, how her mother in her own way is a kind of bore. In another, it seems like such a, such a betrayal of another kind of local thing that we should care about, which is uh, you know, the relationship that one has with her mother and the like, particularly good way in which a mother has, rear has reared her daughter. And I'm just curious as to what you think of that. Yeah, that's a good question, and I'd, I'd, I'd have to uh, think more about how to sort through that. A couple things occur to me. Um, one is that uh, I think the part of what's going on in those latter scenes is that Elizabeth is beginning to see her family through Darcy's eyes, and uh, she she recognizes the the flaws in her family in a way that she hadn't before, and, and um, it it makes sense to her why Darcy would have warned Bingley off from her family. So I think that's, that's actually, it's part of her, part of the process of her falling in love with Darcy. They're, you know, becoming one, taking on a, a, a united mind. Um, and it's also part of her uh, recognition of her own circumstances. I, I, don't, think that, I don't think there's anything, I'd, I'd have to look at the particular passages. I don't think there's anything disrespectful. I think it's truthful. And I'm not sure I'd, I'd agree that her, her mother comes off worse. I think her... Uh, her dad is a lot funnier, uh, and well, her mother's pretty funny, but uh, uh, her dad's a lot more uh, calm and laid back. And but it, I mean, the the mess in the family is largely his negligence, you could say. I had a student uh, years ago who did a uh, uh, senior thesis on uh, the absent fathers in Austen's novels, uh, which is a is a recurring theme. Uh, and I think yeah, Mr. Bennett is. Uh, uh, willing to retire into his library with a book when he should be doing something else. He's willing for somebody else to clean up the messes that his family makes. 
Uh, and you had the passage that James Bowman talked about last night where um, Mr. Bennett has this moment of a sort of uh, penitence, but he's, he, re he realizes that it will pass and that he'll go back and read a book in his library again. So uh, I think they, they're, I don't think that's, I don't think it's, I don't see it as a disrespect. I'd have to, I'd have to look at it more carefully, but uh, I wouldn't see it as disrespect, but it is an, an insight into the Fels, fl faults of her family, which I don't think is a, uh, I don't think that's a, that's a matter of disrespect or dishonor to her, to her parents. We have time for one more question. Okay. All right, last question, promise. Um, so as far as comedy today, you it's, before? yeah. You again. Yeah. I'm Mark. Nice to meet you. Um, so, yeah, you as well. Yeah, well, hey, best for last, I guess. Um, anyway, so as far as comedy today, um, a lot of it's based on instant gratification. If you look at, like, movie numbers for the last seven years or so, uh, there hasn't really been a successful comedy movie, especially one that's well-rated, um, as well as what we're talking about with Jane Austen, how she has a lot of, like, subtle, implied, uh, practical comedy in a lot of her writing. Um, do you think that that could be perhaps why uh, at least people today have a difficult time, or younger people today have a difficult time finding that humor? Because for me personally, my mom had to give me a heads up beforehand that Jane Austen was funny before I took the <laughs> lecture series. And that's just someone who's watched Pride and Prejudice three times with her before. So, Well, I'm, I'm glad your mother gave you the heads up, Mark. That's, that's good. Yeah. If, if you don't realize that, then you're in, you're in trouble. Um, yeah, I... Well, um, I don't know if Whit Stillman is in the room, but uh, uh, I would, I think that if you're looking for Austin-esque humor in films, uh, his films are among the best recent films. I mean, the, the one straight Austin adaptation he did, Love and Friendship, which is an adaptation of Lady Susan, um, is hilarious. Uh, not just because the Lady Susan character is so deliciously evil, um, but they're just, there are some, some really uh, really uh, amusing, bombastic other characters in the film. I, I think it's, well, Austin's Austin style of humor, the passage I read at the end from Sense and Sensibility, a lot of that depends on the way that Austin describes what's happening. So it's, it's not, the situation is already uh, ridiculous because you have this very wealthy man uh, who's spending an enormous amount of time and energy to, to uh, get the exact uh, exact design of this very trivial object that he's interested in, inconveniencing everyone else around him in order to get this. So you have that that kind of uh, comic folly that's there, but it's really, a lot of it is in the way that he, she describes it and describes Robert. So that's very hard to translate into film, I think. Uh, and um, so, I, I, yeah, I, uh, I, I, maybe, I, maybe I'll go back to uh, another thing that I mentioned in the, uh, in the paper. Um, I think maybe Lewis's discussion of the religious and moral ground for comedy would be as good an explanation as anything. Uh, and his point was that um, if you, ha you need something about which you are never ir ironical in order to have irony work. And we live in a world where irony just goes all the way down to the ground. There is nothing that is, doesn't, doesn't dissolve by irony. Uh, Austin is not like that, and so the best the best humorists are going to be the ones that have some kind of uh, some kind of firm convictions about the world, so they can, as Lewis says, that they can recognize the ridiculous when it happens. And uh, uh, I think that maybe that's what's that moral or religious groundwork is what's lacking in a lot of contemporary comedy, because um, you you need that you need to have some standard of comparison in order to show that something is uh, is absurd. Thanks.